Did I use the right term, sexual or gender identity? I think those are the words I we have. I would say I'm not expert either, but I suppose you might all think I am. So. Sexual I don't orientation. know. Did, did, did you know what no, no, no. Um, it, it's whatever is in our current code under uh, Title V, the equal rights, what, it, what the two terms. We have orientation. Sexual so orientation. Right. Okay, so I have that wrong. So that should be orientation. Sexual orientation. Yep. Sexual orientation. Or it's gender identity. I only get that question asked about 10 times a day in contract work, and I still get it wrong every time. Okay, so those were added. Um, and then the responsibility pay, uh, section on page three was really changed because we, we started with employee, then the division managers, then the chair, instead of they were sort, sort of intermixed. Uh, employees have to follow our the administration, PMP. Um, the chair does work, however, with OEO and ER in terms of administrative leave when, if they make a complaint to OEO, because that's uh, something the employees can do. The division manager, so that's the head of the offices, Barbara and Dean, um, uh, just make sure that the employees have our policy, our, the municipal policy, and that's attached to this. Um, and then reports of allegations of uh, discrimination or harassment go to the chair or to the municipal attorney. Um, okay, slow down, I'm sorry. So, so B2, I think. So A, A1 says, you, though you're subject to this other thing, we're incorporating, whatever, we, you do these procedures. The employees, other. each assembly department employee has to follow the administrative PNP because they're employees. They have to do with the administrative. So that's who again? Who is employee? Uh, all of the clerk staff, the um, ombudsman staff, the staff, and the that's part. it. Because yeah. not the assembly, assembly, not you, no. not me. Right. Well, no, I I am well, an employee, yeah. and I have two responsibilities. So under A, I have a responsibility, and under B, I have a responsibility because I'm both. I'm both an employee and a division manager. Okay. The non-employees are generally the assembly and who? Assembly, your aides, interns, and any volunteers. And those are what are called collectively Eric, assembly personnel as opposed to assembly employees. Those are the aides, the interns, the members. They're the non-employees for the most part. And that's the assembly personnel collectively, assembly member, assembly aides, assembly interns, assembly members. And that, that should have been, yeah, it's a duplicate. It should have been assembly volunteer. Volunteer. Okay, yeah. Mr. Train. Remember, at election time, we hire all the workers that work on election. Are they going to come and meet this, too, or we're going to have to train all of them, or what? They are... Um, uh, assembly department employees, and they already are trained on all of this. Well, sure we're talking a lot of people. It's okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Any other assembly member? Okay. Yeah. And then um, the chair of the assembly can request assistance from ever from wherever he or she wants to request assistance at a suggestion of force. I thought it was well taken. Um, uh, excluding assembly members. So we're trying to carve off assembly members. You're going to go a different path, which you'll see later on. Um, request assistance of the municipal attorney if an allegation involves an assembly member. And Mr. Rivera, could you? Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. So I just, um, going back, just wanted to double check on uh, the C and D assembly intern. Um, so we do have interns, and uh, so we're in actually the recruitment phase for that right now. So you said you were going to replace assembly intern with volunteer? No, no, both. So we have you know, add, add, assembly yeah. volunteer, got it. Okay, cool. On D, it says personnel collectively, assembly member, assembly aide, assembly oh, intern, and assembly got member. Got She's going to make it volunteers. It should have been volunteers. So. And you'll see the volunteers are distinct from interns in the definitions. Great. Yeah, yeah Mr. Cheney. Dean? <laughs> the, when I take a look at C2, request assistance from municipal attorney. Who does the municipal attorney work for? Works for the mayor. She works for the mayor. They don't work for the assembly. They don't report to the assembly. They report to the mayor. So, in effect, the employee of the mayor will handle this case. 
for example, we can't, we cannot hire or fire the municipal attorney. You, we can. The municipal attorney, we can. I just want to make sure we're not crossing the boundary of getting the executive branch involved in the legislative branch. Mr. Traney is protecting the separation of powers. Yeah. I've been doing that for years now. Yeah. 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 Do you, do you mind if I answer first and then have Dean I agree? Or Okay, the, the municipal attorney represents the municipality under That's the code. True. Okay, so it does not just represent the administration, um, uh, even though they are appointed subject to confirmation. They also represent the assembly. They represent each branch. They represent the municipality. In this particular case, they are going to be representing the, uh, the, they're going to be representing the assembly process Here's and procedure. I'll make it really simple. Years ago, not now, years ago, I got a legal opinion from the city mayor, city, uh, city attorney. It had TF on it. So I asked him, what's TF for? He said, I don't give you guys anything until Tom Fink signed off on it initially. Okay. So my question is, who is that person working for? Are they working for the city or are they working for the mayor? Okay. In this case, they are definitely working for the assembly. Um, so how do they and separate it? Well, but we already do that now. If an assembly, we represent an assembly in all sorts of things. Assembly come up to us and say, this is confidential. We don't report it to the mayor. That, that's certainly current policy. Now, whether you want to even add that into this to, to make it clear, because Forrest had the same concerns, that in this particular instance, the, assembly, the municipal attorney uh, is working for the assembly. If you could work some language for me, yeah, I'd appreciate it. Mm -hmm. I know you don't like me trying to separate it, but we've had this problem before with other... Other mayors, we had one mayor who got a city attorney to write an opinion that the mayor could, in fact, veto anything we did, including making making a person the chairman of the summer if they wanted to. No, Dick, so, I, I do like you protecting it. We're just we're just talking about the details of it, um, and it wouldn't matter if I didn't um, really. The um, so as if if we were if there were an allegation that we had done something wrong and we were sued, the municipal attorney would represent us in court. Or would we or have could. to Well, no, you would probably choose. I mean, the municipal attorney's office would be available. Okay, so this says the chair of the assembly shall do these three things. Request assistance. Is it, I mean, do you mean may or you're telling me I have to? Well, I guess you could say may. may but what we were trying to just give you all three. You can choose if you want to go to OEO, um, which is a municipal, that is an administration office. Um, or ER, you can choose. I mean, a lot of the complaints, I mean, they're not terrible complaints if there's something small or it's pretty gray or um, can be handled at a lower level than the municipal attorneys with an independent, independent investigator. So we were just trying to give you the options that you could choose a lesser office. See, could you agree with some sort of language that puts a wall between when they're working for us and the mayor? In this instance, they're, they don't go to the mayor they report to us, the chairman of the summit. I just want to make sure we go wall of some type built into it. Well, what, but let's be precise about what we want to have happen here. So, the yeah. chair understands. Yeah. I, I, I think you solve a lot of these issues by changing that shall to may. Because, first of all, because that shall is really difficult to enforce the chair of the assembly. Um, and also because the may gives them the, if they don't trust the municipal attorney's office for some reason, then they can use our attorneys. But I think. I think what we're trying to do in policy here is sort of give the chair a menu of options and also sort of put the municipal attorney's office and the OEO on notice that we expect them to be receptive to us when we go to them. The, come to you, um, but so the other shells are, are real shells. In A, we do want you to do the reporting requirements right. and we want you to do leave. And in B, we do want you to ensure that all employees are familiar and want you to report. This really is a option here. I think that shout should be a thing. Uh, Ms. Quinn-Davidson? Oh, uh, sort of a question, but sort of a comment. I'm just making sure if we change that from shall to may, that doesn't mean that the chair of the assembly doesn't actually have to pursue the claim. Because what we're trying to do is give the chair uh, some variety of options, yeah, flexibility in how they pursue the claim, but I want to make it clear that that right. doesn't mean they don't have to yeah. pursue it at all. Mm. Can I say, and I sort of thought maybe if we did on C2, request... I don't know about me, but request assistance of the municipal attorney or assembly council if an allegation involves an assembly member. I'm also concerned that the chair, we don't let the chair shoot themselves in the foot, that they need to have legal advice, period. Yeah. They may want to not use OEO, or, but, but they have to have legal advice. And, and that's, again, that's municipal attorney does represent the entire municipality, 
but I think we can trust the Assembly Council to know when to talk to the chair and to know you need the municipal attorney's help and judgment here. We do trust ours, because that's the reason I moved that position out of mm -hmm. where I moved it from to where it's at now, because I want, he works for the Assembly, and so I trust him completely, if whoever the chairman has to do that, but like I said, I, I have a problem we have with the city attorney. And it's just um, editor in the form of life, but three doesn't really follow from shall. Right. Um, we didn't know where to throw that in. Yeah, okay. <laughs> I mean, it kind of works. We thought that was it, obvious, but everybody wanted it in here. Um, <laughs> yeah, Barbara. Um, Mr. Chair, I suggest to address Mr. Dunbar and Mr. Traney's concern at the end of C2, um, where, and I think that D's suggestions to add assembly council is a great idea and that could allow you to leave it at shall. But I think you should then, could then add the attorney client privilege will apply to the request from the chair to the municipal attorney. And then that would prevent the municipal attorney from discussing it with anyone without the chair's permission, including the mayor. I, I think the, the, the one thing that I think that I want you to see how limited that is, it's only the request. Because remember, the municipal attorney is going to have to do an inve investigation ultimately. And that investigation could be discoverable if there's ever a claim. So, so as things proceed, the municipality never tells anyone that an investigation is confidential because it might not be. Um, if this were an ordinance, that would make a lot of sense. This is a, a policy. policy, so what? that's a good statement of intent. Does it really bind anybody to anything if I say in a policy, this shall be protected? Maybe we can come up with other words where we end up with that result. Instead of saying okay. this uh, privilege well, applies, we, yeah, well, we, we can come out where anybody would have to conclude that the privilege was applicable. Yeah, Austin. Okay. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. So I'm just sort of looking ahead and seeing that in Section 7, where it actually discusses the investigation, and it's also a reference to Section 26.7a, the matter shall be referred to the municipal charge. So whatever we do here, I'm just going Okay, you're reading ahead. You're cheating. Where, where are you? <laughs> Next page, seven. Seven A. Well, so there's the, there's the question of who we can get advice from, and that can be either one, depending on our comfort level. But then there's the question of sort of things you have to do, channels that you, and and so an assembly member uh, is is the subject of it. I can maybe as get assistance from uh, the municipal attorney or the assembly council. But when it's a <coughs> assembly personnel, there's things I'm just supposed to do. I mean, they need to be under the ordinary processes. And One is kind of, Yeah. So is that is that a distinction for people that personnel you have to, assembly members you have more flexibility or not really? I think you have less flexibility with the assembly members because then it goes to the attorneys right away. And that's, I think, the idea was both to protect yourselves, right. um, but also to protect the city. And so does, does that mean it's a shall, Mr. Dumbo? I mean, uh, is, is it a thing I must do, or any future chair must do, or a thing I may do? And as yeah. it's just written now, it's clear that the false assembly members who have less flexibility. It has to go to the municipal attorney's office and there's nowhere else it's indicated it has to go to. And the municipal attorney's office makes a determination about whether determination about whether it's a less serious allegation that can have a resolution or a more serious allegation, um, uh, allegation rather than. I, I, I sort of normatively I don't have a strong feeling about that, but that it, it is the case that I was written now the municipal attorney can, uh, uh, takes a lot of discretion away from the chair and the assembly as soon as it Again, but you'd be adding in assembly council in there every time. As and well would, as would you on 7A, so cheating like yeah. Austin was doing, mm -hmm. if the allegation of sex discrimination involves an assembly member, the matter shall be referred to the municipal attorney for recommendation, and the attorney may recommend. Okay. I mean, 
Mr. Yeah. Tree, I, I, I meant it. I don't know where you got the impression. I like you defending our um, uh, our powers and, and the separation of powers. I'm just trying to figure out if you say, okay, somebody was alleged, I won't point, so on the assembly. I have to go to the municipal attorney's office. That has all the dangers you talked about. Could be an opposing thing, could be political. If I say you've got to go to Dean, we hire Dean. So one is a possible yeah. mm -hmm. unfair on one end, and one is compromised kind of on mm -hmm. the other. So what do we want to do? Huh? Yeah, right. So what do we want to do that is actually <coughs> fair? Yeah. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. This is awesome. for the record. So I think that I think it should reach out because I don't think we want to give the assembly chair the discretion as to whether he and his team take seriously a claim of sexual harassment or discrimination. And I think he should be under obligation to report to talk to the lawyer and then the lawyer knows what to do. And I don't think, like, if I were chair, I wouldn't necessarily know what all the rules were. I know we're going to have training, but the training will go and then it will be a year later. And so I think it's best policy to have them report it and then the lawyer, who's the expert, decides whether there's an issue. And it also takes the pressure off the chair because the chair doesn't have to make that decision where politics can get involved of, should I report it? Is this something that might get my buddy in trouble? Should I do that? And I think we should take that off of the, as I said, usually male chair and just have him report it. I'm going to make the opposite assumption that the next chair is female. And what, so what should she do? The, um, I'll bet you 50 bucks. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> the, um, <laughs> the, so, oh, yeah. a, um, <laughs> The, um, in any other department, right, it goes to the municipal attorney. This, well, uh, well, it now goes up through all the different not chains. generally get that far. It goes to the supervisor, supervisor, and eventually the municipal it, attorney. It doesn't go supervisor, supervisor. It goes OEO, ER, municipal attorney. Okay, sorry, good. But it ends up there. So, I mean, we're, we're making an as, uh, assumption in our general policies that that's an appropriate place that it resides, and uh, you got to trust some aspect of the system to, to do it. So if she, if every other manager is going to refer her complaints up to um, eventually the municipal attorney, is there a good reason why the chairman of the assembly, why she should? Okay. So back to, back to their question on C. It, I think it's a. I think it's a may request assistance, and over on seven, it's a shall do these things. So it seems like it is, you can get assistance wherever you want, yeah. but you're going to do these things. Exactly. And so if, and, th and that to your point, Mr. Kenny, if we say may, as Mr. Dunbar said in C, if I have concerns about what the municipal attorney might do, I can talk to assembly council about what's going on. But I still have to send it there. That's where everything goes. That's where it's going to go. I can get some help from mine, if you will. But that's where it goes. Does anybody have any idea, anybody, not just assembly members, on any other place that it can go that's, I mean, that's where it's got to end up, right? So that's where all the expertise is. So uh -huh. eventually, Dean would have to ask us, what do you think? Is this a real case? What are the, you know? Does this merit an investigation? And it's all confidential up through the what stage? Well, I think it's, it's got confidential with OEO and it's confidential with the attorney's office. Is it clear in here that the municipal attorney has to keep it confidential? It's not. Again, then that's why I thought I would wordsmith it enough that it would be clear that there's an attorney-client relationship. And then your distinction, Barbara, was, but be, don't rely on that too much. It's confidential in its complaint process, but not, what, what was your, you, you had an important point about how far the confidentiality went. Well, if, if there's litigation or even, I, I'll just tell you, in an Equal Rights Commission complaint, you all know that those are confidential and that's where my background is. If a complainant, so someone that's a victim of sexual harassment or any type of discrimination, files a complaint in court, the Municipal Code, Title V, says that the the investigative file at the Equal Rights Commission is discoverable 
if the person is alleging the same facts and circumstances in the court complaint. So, you know, we label things, it's a confidential investigation at the Equal Rights Commission, D can't see it, Heather can't see it, I can't see it, you can't see it, but yes, it could be produced in court. And so I'm just saying, and I think that's why OEO and ER do not say that any of these are confidential. Okay. And the policy doesn't say that they're confidential. So the, the process is temporarily confidential, but the results aren't. I, I would say for sure they're not. And the reason when it's an assembly member, there's all sorts of case law. If you're high enough up on the chain, personnel matters are not confidential. Uh, that library case that... So once this report is done, it will not be confidential if anybody makes a public record request. And so I had a question on that, and then whoever else wants in. So I see C6, if the final report concludes that the conduct of an assembly member is in, is in violation of the policy, the report may be addressed by the assembly in executive session, which section shall include the municipal attorney. So if the final report concludes it was not a violation, what happens? I guess it maybe goes to the session no matter what. Go ahead. Does Franny have an answer to that? Or? I've got a question for you. Yeah, when you go back, it's very good. Okay, let me come back to you then. So uh, given Barbara's good uh, caution about how far and how far it isn't confidential, so what what is the what is the expectation of what happens when there's a report out? So yes, Assemblymember Croft did this. No, Assemblymember Croft did not. Are there different? Or do, we, we, do we handle those the same way or differently? Yeah, and and I think the reason I dropped that out of here is I was so concerned with that the basis for a recall of an elected official is so low that did we want um, a report that said they weren't? I mean, that's still subject to the public. I I would suggest that you're back to the beginning. The request was from the chair. I think the response that concludes that there wasn't a violation. It goes back to the chair and the municipal attorney, and they decide what action to take. And I think I have to agree with Ms. Quinn Davidson, the chair may be between a rock and a hard place, but the municipal attorney has an obligation to protect the municipality, and that person, um, it's a she right now, yeah. and um, has been in the past. and. Um, she will advise the chair, this is the action we need to take. You need training, you need a letter. We need some remedial action, even if this wasn't a direct violation. But that might be an option that if there's no violation, it goes to the two of them to decide what to do. Well, well I want, for the, for the assembly members, what do we want our own rules to be, right? That's what, that's what we're doing here. What, on what basis, should the chair not release a report, whichever way it goes? I mean, if it's if the investigation comes out and the, there was an allegation, <coughs> confidential for a while, and they found no basis for it, why wouldn't you release that? Why do it in executive session, which um, people worry about? Or on the other end, there was an allegation, there was a confidential investigation, and it said you did do errors Shouldn't both of those be public? Yeah, I'm going to still work on this for a while. I'll come back to you tonight, Mr. Dumbo. I don't think we want to set a policy that you have to release the report under any circumstances, particularly if it was found to not be a violation, both because of, I mean, pri primarily because the victim might not want that report released, right? And although I, I assume the victim's names are scrubbed from these. Executive summary, a couple lines up. Yeah, even then, you might be able, people can, uh, journalists or other folks can extrapolate from those things and figure out who the victim was, right? Um, and, and so I think we have to be careful about anything that requires us to put reports in the public. Okay, so maybe I mean executive summary. I, I actually don't know what I mean on this, but um, should the executive summary be public? I, you know, can, anybody can request it and they're going to get it. The executive Whether, summary? Yeah. It's, it's a definitely a public record. I don't think we want to, there are certainly cases where it can be released, but I don't think you want to have any policy that mandates that we do so. You're talking about the report itself as opposed to this executive summary? I'm talking about both. She's saying that the executive summary is going to be out. 
I, I, you may not want a policy that says you release it automatically, but if but someone requests it, it's think about it, like if, if this, is, this is all confidential, I mean, for most of this, there's members of the public aren't going to find out that the confidential report was filed and an investigation was done, and then, they're, they're, then that executive summary exists, you know? And so unless the victim or someone close to the victim or someone else that's directly connected to the case makes that public request, no one will know this stuff happened. And I know that some you know people want you know total transparency all the time. And there's that sort of ethic, but in the real world, in practice, that means that victims lose their ability to report. So in, in the military, for example, we have a very strict confidential reporting system. We have reports where they can report and not and even mandate that the investigation doesn't go forward. They just want to talk to folks and and get necessary. Um, uh, support, you know, counseling and, and medical or whatever it is, right? And 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 I think that has worked fairly well in in a, giving victims make it feel like they have the freedom to come forward and not start a process that they immediately lose total control over. Okay, really, really good points and ones I hadn't thought of. But so it seems to me you should say the executive summary shall be made public because it's going to be. If, you, if you're saying it is, even respecting what you were saying about the report itself. But there's a difference between saying it shall be made public and just knowing legally that it could be made public if somebody requested it. Okay, and I'm, I'm saying if it, if it could be, it should be, and, and it should just be done. But on the report, I I it's, that, that. okay, that's fine, but on the report, it seems like you say, at the request of the victim or the assembly member, it shall be made public? No. Well, who, who um, can legally request the report? Anybody could, any yeah, person. So. The report? Oh, not the full report. The, the, and, 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 but, but just so you know, you brought up a very good point before, Eric. Wow. This is a PMP, and we can't make law in here. Yeah. And so that really, if we wanted to attach some confidentiality to some of this, we'd, we'd throw it into our public records law and add a line or something. Um, so, so we have to be careful about this. This is just a PMP. I put you off. I apologize, Mr. Trent. The, or would you remind us what the options are here of the semi We can't send through, yeah. we can't expel them, so maybe making this public is our only option because we don't have the ability to censure somebody. We don't have the ability to expel a member. There's things we can't do at this body. So maybe making a public is something you've got. Yeah. And, and, that's, and that's why I think we want to have the discretion to do so. I'm, I'm taking issue with the idea of the shall. Of the, our policy is whenever any of these investigations are done, regardless of the outcome, regardless of the wishes of the victim, we're just going to push it into the public, even an executive summary. I think that's full hard. Yeah. Of course, part of you, you talk to the military, it's part of that UCMJ red driven, or is that still civil law driven? You've got a different system under UCMJ than we do. The, the, the criminal and civil distinction I don't think is material here because in the military, things can result in both administrative action and in criminal, uh, criminal charges. But the point is that the reporting system, um, it, it, first of all, it's, it's relatively difficult to get any of those out of the public space. Maybe it's too difficult. Mm -hmm. um, but it, it, uh, there certainly is nothing that mandates the military, for example, publish every report that comes forward or every invest every 156 is concluded because we know this is a type of investigation because there are you know, dozens of them done. And, and it's not hard to figure out who the victim is in a lot of those cases. So the, we're, uh, just note, yeah. we're, uh, Dee guaranteed me we'd only take 20, 25 minutes to do this. It'd be a breeze. But, and, and, and thank you, Mr. Dunbar, for the way you approach this. I, I think you could have just done this as chair, decided not to, decided to put it before us, and that slowed it down, but we'll all then have a shot at making it work right. I had Ms. Wimhoff and then, and then Barbara. Yeah. Actually, I'm in, in going along with what Forrest was saying, I'm thinking about even what just happened with our governor and lieutenant governor situation, um, where something was conversed about, it was talked about, nothing formal came out, no victim was identified, no um, specifics were identified, but action occurred. And in that case, people seem to accept that in that, in that sense. But there is the idea that if this is available anyway, if someone asked for it through a um, you know, public information or something, then giving the discretion whether or not to present it as a policy every single time um, is not keeping the public from the information because they can request it. But it is allowing the chair 
the ability to decide whether or not it should be officially put out. And if we do say it will happen every time, then we are in a situation that means that every single thing would go out, even if it's minor. And um, and if it was big enough that the public was already hearing about it, then it may make a great deal of sense to then when it's it's shown that nothing that nothing happened or something was you know taken care of, then it makes a great deal of sense to put that out there so that people have an answer. But I I don't know that mandating that every single time it be reported when if we know the executive summary is available to the public anything. Barbara then me. Um, Mr. Through the chair, I think that you have to look at the purpose of this policy and the purpose of the policy is to prevent discrimination and harassment and obviously provide support to the victims if there is a victim and I think producing reports, I think we all know it prevents victims from reporting. People don't want to be in the public everyone knows who they are it it stops mostly women from reporting sexual harassment or discrimination i think we all know that it's probably not confidential but i think you should not um, affirmatively state that you're going to produce the reports right i um me and then um, Ms. quinn davidson i think we're balancing here as opposed to the military which has its own rules for a lot of good reasons. Elected officials and the people having knowing about the allegations made against them, and very legitimately, victims uh, both rights to confidentiality and encouragement to report. And it seems to me the, the best way to balance those two things is to say, you shall have an executive summary that does not have the victim's name, that is disclosed every time. So there was a complaint against an assembly member and the municipal attorney found no basis for it. Or there was an, a, a complaint of sexual harassment without the victim's name, and there was a basis for it. Either way, it ought to be out. And that you say the final report is not, either shall never be released unless the victim wants. So you put the victims back in control, hold on a second, um, or you have very limited criteria for when they would. Like the, the chair shall not unless she determines this thing. Um, uh, and one of those things is the victim request. I do think the victims ought to be in charge of that. And if they want it out, uh, I, I, it ought to be out. And it certainly ought to, the public ought to know every time an investigation was done and here's what was found. An assembly member acted improperly. And that gets it out for the public to know in the election, which is, as you said, the only process we have. We don't have our own process. The process we have is the people, and if they don't know, they can't do it. But, it. but it protects the victim, both in the executive summary and in giving them control over the report itself. But you just described this legally impossible. What you said at the end, we, 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 we reserve the full report only to the victim. But what he is saying is anyone can request that full report. No, she, she yeah, said no, this. including, well, I think even the full report. Includes. Well, I don't know if we have victim. Yeah, I, I think you probably have some summary, confidentiality so requirements. Yeah, you so could probably, probably look at that. But the victim, yeah, and I don't know that answer. If the executive summary is pushed out every time, what is the journalist to say, giving a full report to the way to this executive summary? Eric, because the victim always can at least get the executive summary and the next paragraph, they can always go to a compliance agency if they're not mm -hmm. satisfied. Um, uh, and, and the basis for recall is so low. I just think that, that it's such a problem. Well, you're trying to protect us, and I appreciate I it, but, but no, I think it's... The most it's minor infraction. It, calling out the victim's name, and, and she'll, she'll flesh out that distinction between the executive summary, yeah. whether it, um, the, if the whole report is discoverable, then we're arguing theoretically about something that's coming out anyway, or it, it is, um, is requestable. But, but I think the public should have a right to know the determination on every assembly member, that it was not, I mean, that it was not uh, found valid is fair, and that it was. Now, uh, again, respecting the victim's right to not have their name there, and also some power over the report itself. So, yeah, I guess I'd really like to know whether, if the report's getting out anyway, I guess that changes some of the calculus. Did you want back in and then? 
Is there anyone else? And then Mr. Training. But Ms. Quinn Davidson, Mr. Training, Mr. Peterson. Ms. Quinn Davidson. Thank you. Um, so I think it would be useful to, well, I don't see any reason to release a report if it's been found that the allegations are unsubstantiated. Like, to me, that's just asking people to create claims that aren't true to cause political ramifications. So I personally, especially given what Barbara said about how that impacts victims, I don't know. I, I don't, why, why would we do that? Uh, rhetorical, or you want to answer, the, the public has a right to know what happened. And but if it's not a legitimate, if it's determined not to be actionable, why would we want the public to know that someone made an that's not correct. I mean, to me, that just seems like stirring up trouble. Well, then I want it out. I mean, if it's, a, or whoever the assembly member is, because it's about an elected official, and positive or negative, I have a right to know about it. And, Even and, if it's false? Yeah, because I may be operating under the assumption that they did. I've heard about it. It's a small town. Everyone knows what's going on. And if there's no vehicle to say, yeah, and it didn't have, it, they looked into it. It wasn't real. Uh, Eric. Yeah. yeah. This hasn't. This may hasn't happened to me this chair yet, but I don't think everybody knows everything all the time. So these things do happen, and they are resolved by the informal process. And all these 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 professionals here are doing this all the time, and you don't actually hear about every claim. Um, and. Uh, just to be clear, it didn't involve me. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but How do I know that? <laughs> yeah, exactly. um, because it would have involved you then, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. <laughs> as the vice chair. Well, yeah. not before. I mean, right. I. So, no, as the vice chair, I would have, right? So, um, no. you, you, uh, I, I, I really agree with what Austin said, although maybe I phrased it a little bit differently. I, I the, the, the full report is going to be there and it's going to be discoverable. It's certainly by the victim. I need to look into that further. I need Todd, to know that. Todd Sherwood. Imagine the name is discovered. Oh no, there's got to be victim protections. But yeah, but that let me can't be real. let me. Legally, I just but the but the 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 executive summaries. Again, I really want to caution us against just pushing out all these executive sub summaries, even if they are unsubstantiated. What you said about in your case, you would want it out in the public. Um, uh, because if it was found to be substantiated, I don't, I don't think that is the case for every assembly member. I think they would rather, if they knew the whole thing was confidential up to that point, they would just want it to remain in that silo until someone who knew that something like that had happened for whatever reason, because they were the victim or they were a particularly enterprising journalist, came and did that discovery request. Um, but. I, I feel like I've lost track of the thing. I know you had Mr. Peterson and then Dick, so Mr. Peterson. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And so um, I'm wondering uh, if we can find a way to be consistent uh, with the way that ethics violations are handled. Uh, because sometimes someone may file a report against an assembly member, and that, I don't believe that information is released unless. Uh, it's found to be an ethics violation, and so that's a good question. I, I think the sexual harassment is just another, just another form of an ethics violation. And what so does I, happen I think with that? should be consistent. With how, how does that handle an ethics? An if, ethics if violation. An allegate, well, I mean, usually the ethics violation is within two areas: I mean, conflict of interest and. Uh, well, conflict of interest is in the main one. So we're really in a very small area of expertise for the ethics yeah. board. They don't have any idea of sexual harassment or what are the real standards. Well, not that it goes to the board, but is, is it confidential? If an ethics complaint against an assembly yes, member, the it is result. Is, yes. Is there any summary? Um, yes. Yes. And we so, just forgot about the rules, so I'm trying to think of yes, there is a so summary. So they say ethics complaint was filed against uh, assembly member Croft and found to not have merit. What does we, it say? I think we do a scrubbed version. Well, I'd have to look at that because we just rewrote the code. And I think in the old days... Exe ethics complaint was filed against a an unnamed assembly member and found to not have... that They did the these complaint. things and not have merit. Well, I'm not sure. I'd, I'd have yeah. to look at it because like we, we just rewrote the rules. Yeah. Anyway, so I'm, 
for me, I, I think that would make sense if we were consistent in, in this instance, if, we, if we possibly can be. Okay. Robert, Mr. Traney, and then Mr. Marshall. I think we just yeah, I'm it. wondering who, let's share the same member, you're accused of this, and you were found innocent. Not but guilty. You were still defamed because you were accused of it. Who would you file suit against? The chairman of the assembly or the city of Anchorage? Because I could see where a assembly member would file suit. My question is, who's the suit going to go against? The chairman of the assembly, the assembly as a whole, or go to the city attorney to defend it? Because keep in mind, when we start with these accusations that are flying all across the country, it doesn't mean they're valid. Carrying on, is in the ethics situation, can I make it public? That is, an ethics thing was filed? And I think in the old days it was, and again, I, I think we largely scrubbed the complaint the portion, um, was that in the old days, you, if you were found to be, that you violated, that that was public. If you weren't, then we either kept it confidential or scrubbed it, one or the other. Um, yeah, or Mr. Remember my the complaint against because I I had one filed against me because they showed up at my parents, but they knew that Joe claimed that I forced the police department to give a ticket to him because I showed up there. Didn't say a word to the police officer. Remember he brought this complaint against me and they wrote right. it was invalid. I'm but not sure if we just don't dismiss the complaint and we didn't publish it. Um, unless it was, or maybe it's up to ethic board if we thought there was a helpful lesson involved. So I'm not sure you're going to find a clean analogy, but I'd be glad to look for it. Okay. Thank you. Um, Mr. Dumbar, so yeah, I was going to say on, on that too. To me, the biggest distinction between most most ethics complaints and sexual harassment complaints, although it's in that particular case there actually was a victim, but sexual harassment complaints is almost always the victim. Whereas in your conflict of interest, it's sort of like the public writ large is the victim, but you right. you know there, there isn't like an identifiable person whose whose privacy could be violated if, if, if this became public. Yeah, Ms. Davis. I don't know where we're headed if we're going to keep talking about this or still bring it to state or what, but I think it would be useful to know, you know, a lot of us are talking about the victims and what they want and what benefits or doesn't benefit them. And beyond Barbara's sort of anecdotal, like, oh, we know that it doesn't benefit victims to have reports out there. I think that probably to some extent it does because the more people who report, the more people who feel like I can report too. But I don't know the stats on that and I don't know where that line is drawn and does it matter if it's an executive summary or does it matter if the allegations were false or true or like I would like to know how does that impact people's willingness and interest in reporting because to me that's one of the factors and I don't feel like I have all that information and I don't know if you have more of that depending on the situation and that might inform our decision. Yeah, Ms. I, I just want it might be a good jumping off spot too is I was thinking if you have some of the agency people who deal with this all the time yeah. Heather and a couple of us meet and get people like Todd Sherwood that know confidentiality and for us to generate some more information that we think might be helpful for you. Or bring them back here. So, yeah. Mr. Dunbar, we, I really appreciate, like I said, the, you bringing this forward, the way you brought it forward, not just doing it, but putting it forward. What would you like to do on it? You mean what would I like to do with the actual language? Or what no, would like you're wrong on that. What would you like to do on the process? <laughs> <laughs> the, um, so my understanding is this, this actually hasn't caught on the agenda yet. And if that's the case, then I, I think... Not the... Uh, you're late on the table is there. Yeah. But the, the additional version, the, yeah, another... You want to have another one? Well, well, the, yeah. the previous AR that we introduced in December is there. It's mm -hmm. continued to this meeting. Mm -hmm. But it doesn't have this as an attachment to it. Is that right? Right. It has so the other modified version. What I would propose then is that we continue to work on this and we get this... I would rather this not be late on the table. But if there's some way to get it on the regular agenda for... Is that January 29th? Um, our second meeting of January. That would be today at noon. Oh, really? So yeah. February 7th. Okay, so at the addendum. I'm comfortable with the addendum. I don't want to lay it on the table. Um, and yeah, so that would be my, my recommendation. Yeah, I think that's a good idea. Thank you. We do have an assembly meeting the 29th. So that's, what, that's what you're saying. The 29th. The regular agenda, the 29th of, of, of January, Barbara is saying that the, the, the deadline is today. Um, regular agenda deadline um, is today. I'm sorry, isn't it next Friday? What is next Friday? Is that is that our 10 days? Today. Yeah, 10 days next, would be next Friday. Next Friday. Okay, but sorry, next Friday. Time, do we have time to, I mean, no. that's a week from now to go through and try to talk to all these people and maybe have another conversation 
Well, I've proposed, I mean, yeah, I think we do have time and I can put a work session on and you can bring all those people that know all those things that we don't and we can try and try it again, if, if that's what you guys want to use. Yeah, I, I won't be here on that date, but I think most of the discussion will happen in advance, right? Yeah, well, I think most of them have to do a discussion. Will their discussion happen in advance? Yeah, right? and then we'll have another work session. Yes. I guess, yeah, if it, yeah, if we're going to admit, if I would miss a lot of the discussions, I would think it's not going to be a big, I mean, it's hard to talk about. Wait, are you saying you're gone all next week? I'm going to be gone on the 29th. I'm actually oh. flying while well, I can't call in. Okay, no, yeah, so sometime that, that works for most of the people next week after our assembly meeting, we can have, but I was thinking instead of them meeting and coming back, we would actually line them up and have them and be able to ask questions on what is the process and when is it confidential and what do victims yeah. usually do and things like that, if that would be helpful. Yeah, helpful. The, the, and the, the Friday at noon deadline is just to make the regular agenda. Like I said, I, I'm comfortable putting it on the agenda. I just don't want to wait on the agenda. Right. Yeah. Okay, unless anyone has a better idea, I'll try and find it, uh, Ms. Wenhoff. Well, I was just going to make a comment before we let this process. Okay. I will look for another work session time next week after Tuesday. Uh, let's get through Tuesday, and we will coordinate with you to have people who can tell us more about this process. Uh, Ms. Wenhoff. Yeah, mine is just a simple thing on, on number 6C. Uh, it says the charity symbol shell, and then it has a colon, which implies that the rest of the sentence will be in the next paragraph. And on number three, yeah. you got that. Okay. Well, they, they said they didn't know where to put it when we asked before. They said it, it, it seems it seems to me that it might even be a, um, a, a D. It's actually in the definition, so we ought to just get rid of it. Oh, good. Sure. Yeah. It's actually oh, in the definition. Oh, it's, yeah. yeah, perfect. It's an English yeah. teacher. Now. Yeah, no, I, would, <laughs> that's great. I noticed it too. Okay. Um, we will bring it back up, then that adjourns this work session. Mr. Yeah. Chair, can we unadjourn the work session? Oh, I'm sorry. What? <laughs> um, the clerk's office wanted one more, One more time. <laughs> so with the clerk's office tagged on, since this was partly our work session, we wanted to talk to you a little bit about the election. Could I make a couple announcements from your meeting on... It? I'll take one minute. Or do you want me to gavel in the valuation one, and you can just start it? Or that it's not on the agenda? Um, well, I think it's more related to this since this is related to the clerk's I'm sorry, office. Then we are it's not, up to you. Not adjourned, and the work session continues. And Mr. Weddleton is here and can't leave. <laughs> and so, and Mr. Constant just joined us. Okay, great. And uh, Madam Clerk, announcements, announcements, yeah, announcements, announcements. Okay, so announcements on elections. We are today at E minus eighty one. 81 days until the election, April 2nd, 2019. The election calendar is published on the website. Two important dates. Uh, uh, the most important is Tuesday is the date for introduction of ordinances. The 29th is the date for passage of ordinances. Also- If they're gonna appear on the ballot. On the ballot, correct. The other date that's on the calendar is January 30th is the last day to submit initiative or petition, um, referendum petitions. Um, we had a little discussion about that at the work session. Filing for office paperwork, five assembly seats, two school board seats, 28 LURSA seats. Remember for Mr. Weddleton and Ms. LaFrance, remember that your LURSA board members are required to file as a qualified write-in five days before the election if they want to write in. I think Mr. Um, Dyson and Ms. Um, Wemhoff also have a couple of service boards in their areas. There's applications to have your ballot mailed to a temporary address on the website. Um, the election center is gonna be up and running next week. We're gonna be accepting applications there. We had some minor earthquake damage and the most exciting thing is we got a little video off of it because we have our nine cameras down there. So we're trying to put that together. We have um, four new drop boxes have been ordered and we've been working with Mr. Peterson and Mr. Dunbar to set up a new accessible vote center in East Anchorage. We have an address verification postcard that's gonna go out to 235,000 registered voters in Anchorage. So we're up from 18,000, so um, 17,000 more registered voters this year than last year. 
Um, social media is ongoing and we're going to re-engage our stakeholders group. And that's it from elections. If you have any questions, let us know. We just wanted to give you all an update um, and keep you posted. Thank you. For Thank that you, Mr. Chair. On election. It was? Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. Then I will adjourn the work session.